Good afternoon. It's Monday, the 26th of November, 2018, just after one o'clock. Welcome to UK Column News. Uh, I'm your host, Mike Robinson. Joining me in the studio today, Patrick Henningsen, once again. Thank you for joining us, Patrick. Great to be with you, Mike. Um, now, if you're watching uh, Friday's programme, we'll get straight into this. You're watching Friday's programme. Uh, we were covering the new defence relationship between uh, Britain and Ukraine. And, uh, you know, the, Gavin Williamson announced that we were going to be sending troops to Ukraine to train Ukrainian troops and so on. But this is one of the things that they were saying. Uh, HMS Echo will deploy to the Black Sea in 2019 to demonstrate the UK's support to ensuring freedom of navigation in the region. Now, Brian made the point that HMS Echo is not a major fighting warship, but nonetheless, this is a, <laughs> this is a bit ironic, isn't it, that uh, the UK suggesting that we're going to ensure freedom of navigation in the region, bearing in mind uh, what has happened since then, Patrick? Well, this is a scene, this video footage is taken, uh, I believe, Mike, from a Russian uh, border patrol uh, naval vessel uh, here right outside of the Kursk Straits. We'll give you a breakdown on that, but you can look at this right now. You'll see the moment of collision right here uh, with this Russian border patrol hitting a Ukrainian tugboat that was escorting two small Ukrainian warships. Huge incident right there. That culminated uh, in a shootout, Mike, uh, after three hours of uh, being held, Russia has seized three Ukrainian naval vessels uh, right now uh, in the Kursk Straits just by the Crimean Bridge. There's, this is the geography, Mike. This is important for people to understand. The Kursk Straits is uh, Crimea and Russia. This is now, now Crimea is now part of the Russian Federation as of 2014. It's still contested, of course, by the U.S., NATO, uh, and the Ukraine. Uh, and there is the Straits, and this is the area in question that we're looking at. So this, this is, these ships were trying to gain access from the Black Sea to the Sea of Azov. Okay, so this is fully controlled 100% by Russia, and according to national law and the law of the seas, uh, Russia has the right to uh, restrict uh, any access that might threaten its national security. Okay, now bear in mind, there have been Ukrainian ships, Mike, that have gone in and out of this uh, since 2014, but they have notified in advance they're on the shipping lane schedule with the, with the, 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 the master of the, uh, the straits there. And so there is protocol. These three boats, Mike, uh, were not following protocol, according to reports. They're trying to force their way through uh, without going through the proper channels, hence the altercation. Uh, and so just if people weren't aware, Russia just built a bridge uh, this is the Crimean Bridge. That is over the Kursk Straits. As you can see, there's a Russian oil tanker blocking it. No vehicle, vessels will go in or out, either coming out of the Sea of Azov or from the Black Sea going into the Sea of Azov. You can see it's fully blocked. Uh, and that, uh, that ship has been put in place since this incident? Yes, this was put in place uh, yesterday afternoon. So this is a security measure uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, this is a very tense situation, Mike. Uh, so... This, what's really important, Mike, is uh, this is the incident that's happened. Um, by the way, uh, three Ukrainian sailors were, were wounded or uh, were injured. We're not clear which is which, uh, but the Russian uh, border patrol uh, boat had to fire to stop them from proceeding, uh, fire in front of them, and I don't know if it hit the ship. We don't have the details, but they're okay. They received medical care uh, by the Russians, and they're most likely, Mike, they're going to be released if they haven't already been released by now, we don't know. Uh, but there's so no one is uh, no casualties, as it were, serious casualties. Uh, so, but it's important, Mike, to understand the timeline of events. What is the context in which this is happening? And so, the, uh, a few months ago in April, the Ukraine detains a Russian ship uh, apparently for illegal sand mining. But this set a, a sort of uh, series of events in motion. That was in April 17. And then April after, 18. Or sorry, April 18. Uh, and then after that, uh, the Ukraine extends, this is very controversial, passed a measure extending its territorial waters by 12 nautical miles off its southern coast. Uh, this was just a few months ago, Mike. And is this allowed under international law? Um, I, I'm not sure. It, it, it certainly could be contested. Uh, the, the reason given by Kiev was to deter smugglers. But, but looking at the, this event that's happened over the weekend, Mike, this altercation, uh, I, I find it possible that these two might be uh, very much connected. Um, it's just beyond a coincidence. Now, that's, it doesn't end there, Mike. 
then uh, we have these two uh, announcements uh, by the United Kingdom, which we showed earlier with Gavin Williamson trying to ensure freedom of navigation. Uh, so, and also the deployment of the HMS Echo into the Black Sea in 2019, and a statement by the head of the British, the new head of the British Armed Forces, uh, General Carlton Smith. Russia is the biggest threat to UK national security. So that was right after the Gavin Williamson statement, and then. Uh, Early in the morning, this is 8.30, uh, Mike, 8.30 a.m. GMT, the Ukraine deployed two armored warships heading towards the Kirsch. They mysteriously, Mike, turned around uh, when the Russians seized these three boats. So is that a coincidence? Um, Russia doesn't think so. Uh, and of course, after that, we have the incident in question, a naval altercation in the Kursk Straits, three Ukrainian vessels detained uh, and then, then the Ukraine resumes shelling at 7.30 last night of the Donbass. Now, bear in mind that, uh, that somewhat of a ceasefire has held. Things looked like they were heading in the right direction, Mike, in the Donbass in eastern Ukraine. Then all of a sudden, this naval incident happens. And the uh, Ukrainian army uh, resu resumes using its military against its own people uh, in eastern Ukraine. And lo and behold, President Poroshenko, who is currently polling third, in the upcoming presidential election calls for martial law as a result of this naval altercation, which has happened yesterday afternoon. Bear in mind, this is ahead of elections, and he's not doing particularly well. So uh, that's, that's a bit of a coincidence then? Uh, supposedly, yes. I think you could say this might, some people might say it's an overreaction, uh, but what's important about the martial law issue, Mike, it's not just a military issue. You're talking about full control of the press, uh, you wouldn't be allowed to criticize the government if it is a state of war, effectively, or martial law. Uh, freedom of movement, Mike. Mm. Uh, no journalists. Uh, they would be very picky about what foreign journalists they would allow into the country. Uh, so it, it, basically a full lockdown of Ukrainian society. One could say it, this is based on the pretext of not a real war, but of a relatively minor altercation, which ended uh, not too well. But... It's uh, a relatively minor, Mike, in mm. comparison to other incidences. But this would effectively prepare the Ukraine, Mike, for a, a real hot war in the near future. This would be a 60-day martial law, uh, apparently, and it could be renewed after 60 days, uh, according to uh, reports, Mike. Uh, right, so, so the latest in the chat box is that Ukraine is, the Ukrainian Security Council has just approved martial law a few minutes ago. This is a very unfortunate uh, development. development. This, is, this effectively means they're preparing for a hot war. This is going to, uh, it, there's not a lot of positives with mm. this. Mike, we'll go back to this timeline. Uh, and U.S. deploys uh, its spy plane over the Black Sea this morning. Uh, that's at 5.30 a.m. GMT Monday morning. The U.S. and its electronic warfare, uh, a Boeing, which we'll show you the details of that flight in a minute. But lo and behold, Mike, and this is a, we're told this is just a coincidence. Um, this is all happening the day before the G20 meeting in Buenos Aires between Trump and Putin. Just a coincidence. Just a coincidence. Yeah. We're, meant, we're meant to see. And, we're, and we'll show you that there are uh, organizations, uh, Atlantic Council organizations, that are trying to warn people off these talking points. They don't want people to make these connections. Uh, so here is... The uh, v vessel, this is uh, this morning, or this is on the day, actually, this was Sunday, uh, 8.30 GMT, Border Guard Services uh, registered the advancement of two uh, Gerza-class artillery armored boats. There's one pictured there uh, in the inset, uh, have left the port of Berdyansk, and then all of a sudden turned back, but they were heading for the Kurt Straits. This is uh, a movement that can be confirmed, okay? so. What were they expecting? This, was this a coincidence? Was the Ukraine uh, hoping to escalate the situation? And here is the U.S. spy plane that was deployed uh, just this morning uh, over the Ukraine. And if we look at the details of this, this is a Boeing RC-135V. Uh, this is a standard reconnaissance electronic warfare plane uh, which left Crete, a uh, U.S. base on the island of Crete, entering Bulgarian airspace uh, this morning, heading f towards the Crimean Peninsula, Mike. So, uh, you know, whichever way you want to cut it, um, we we also have to throw this in, Mike, early this year. This is the Atlantic Council. 
um, how the U.S. can shore up the Ukraine's vulnerabilities in the Black Sea, okay? So, it, Mike, um, a series of events here. It's very hard to say this is a coincidence. This, this to a lot of people who are informed, this looks like a planned provocation by the Ukraine and who's behind the Ukraine, NATO. Uh, in the United States and the UK and all these... The, and the EU, of course. And the EU, the leading voices, the anti-Russian voices. Uh, this is who's who's behind the Ukraine, egging it on to uh, an altercation against a more powerful neighbor, Mike. They've just declared martial law. Mm. So hugely a dangerous move. Uh, Petro Poroshenko uh, is a limping... Uh, wounded uh, at political animal in terms of his popularity. This, is, of course, could also move the elections back, Mike, and give him time to shore up some support. Um, these aren't speculations. These are these are actual political realities. Mm. Uh, so, <laughs> um, so who's yeah. uh, who's Dinara Barajan then? Well, this is the assistant director of the uh, DFR Labs, the Atlantic Council's crack team to to fight. Uh, Russian uh, propaganda and Russian disinformation. And she actually did a hit piece uh, on myself uh, and some other people just in October. And she's based in Riga in Latvia. She recently graduated from university and she's quickly been made assistant director of the DFR labs in, char uh, as you do, yeah. in charge of fighting the Russian menace. Uh, and so she's tweeted this out this morning. She said, here's a list of pro-Kremlin and Kremlin-funded media outlets uh, and trolls, uh, this is what they're peddling online about the Curse Strait incidents. I'll update you on more narratives later. Of course, she's uh, named all these different talking points. Like, basically, these are things that we must ignore. The Ukraine staged a premeditated provocation and with the help of Soros. She's thrown in George Soros. That's called gaslighting, to throw in a, a red herring like that, to just discredit any... Uh, any dissent off the official line on this, but some of the things that she's listed in here, Ukraine staged a premeditated provocation to disrupt upcoming meeting between Trump and Putin at the G20. Uh, we're, we're told that that's just uh, out of bounds in terms of speculation. Uh, and, <laughs> and so what, what else have we got here? The Ukraine staged a premeditated provocation to trigger more sanctions against Russia. Well, we just have to look at the rhetoric coming out of Washington this week, and we'll see if that is true or not, Mike. Mm. So that's the DFR labs. Now, if we continue on that, if we continue on that, uh, we'll see. This one is particularly interesting, Mike. Number nine, Kiev and NATO staged a provocation to further sour U.S.-Russian relations and cause a confrontation. Well, isn't that what what's happened, Mike? But she's saying that this is simply a, a pro-Kremlin narrative, which is being presented by pro-Kremlin trolls. Like, like us, we're, we're meant to be pro-Kremlin trolls. What's really interesting about this though, Mike, is that, well, it seems to be getting a lot of engagement on social media there, one retweet and one like. So apparently <laughs> a lot of people aren't paying attention to this, but yet this is where our taxpayer money is really going at the end of the day and where the defense industry is throwing its cash. Uh, well, well, let's look at where uh, taxpayer money is going, uh, because, of course, the news which broke on Friday uh, in the Russian press, admittedly, uh, was highlighting these uh, this leak, this uh, hack from Anonymous. Uh, it says in the text here, uh, greetings, we are Anonymous. We have obtained a large number of documents relating to the activities of the Integrity in Initiative project that was launched back in the fall of 2015 and funded by the British government. The declared goal of the project is to counteract Russian propaganda and the hybrid warfare of Moscow. Hiding behind benevolent intentions, Britain has in fact created a large-scale information secret service in Europe, the United States and Canada, which consists of representatives of political, military, academic and journalistic communities uh, with the think tank in London at the head of it. Um, so at the, on Friday, we were looking at this with great interest, Patrick, uh, and a certain amount of skepticism as well, it has to be said, uh, because it seemed a little bit too good to be true. Uh, but we looked and we've examined it and so on. Now, um, this is the Integrity Initiative. Uh, let's have a look at that. And let's look at what they say about themselves. Uh, the Integrity Initiative was set up in autumn 2015 by the Institute for Statecraft in cooperation with the Free University of Brussels, to bring to the attention of politicians, policymakers, opinion leaders, and other interested parties 
the threat posed by Russia to democratic institutions in the United Kingdom, across Europe and North America. The Integrity Initiative aims to unite people who understand the threat in order to, in order to provide a coordinated Western response to Russian disinformation and other elements of hybrid warfare. Uh, and it goes on to say an effective network is best achieved by forming in each European country a cluster of well-informed people from the political, military, academic, journalistic and think tank spheres who will track and analyze examples of disinformation in their country and inform decision makers in other interested parties, sorry, and other interested parties about what is happening. Um, so, I mean, this is the UK cluster, for example, and we can see a lot of names on there. Edward Lucas, who's formerly The Economist and now The uh, uh, Times, uh, David Aranovich of The Times, uh, a few others on there that are, are of interest. Uh, but we see email addresses. I've redacted them there, but people can find the document for themselves and look at all the email addresses that are on these. Uh, but we see email addresses uh, linked to the Atlantic Council, to NATO, uh, to the PJHQ, which is the joint Euro EU military headquarters in Northwood and North London, mm -hmm. uh, Royal Naval uh, Base or office uh, and uh, we've got people like various think tanks and so on demos bill, and 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 the likes and bill browder um, uh, the notorious uh, bill browder of hermitage capital he's he's also on the list as abso well. absolutely uh, and and one mp who is brad Bro sorry ben bradshaw and as we as i said on the uh, uh sunday wire last night patrick ben bradshaw of course has been pushing this anti-russia rhetoric and narrative and in fact alleged in alleged in the house of commons that russia had been interfering with the brexit referendum <laughs> so that's where that started so that's where that started interesting so um let's have a look at uh, who is running this uh, this is one of the directors uh, chris n donnelly he's a founder of uh, the integrity initiative and of the think tank statecraft that's behind it uh, and who is he well he is a director of the institute of statecraft uh, he was head of the soviet Studies Research Centre at the Royal Military Academy in Sandhurst. Uh, he was former advisor to Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, and he was former special advisor to the Secretary General of NATO. So, Patrick, this is a pretty significant uh, individual. It is, and he's also, bear in mind, look at, looking at his, uh, uh, his age and his service, he's a Cold Warrior, effectively. So he made his career, Mike, um, within the Cold War framework. Uh, so it would would have been very anti-Soviet, uh, reds under the beds. So he would be the perfect person to put in charge of the reboot of uh, of a Red Scare, uh, which is what what we I believe we're seeing right here. Uh, absolutely. Now, if anybody wants to uh, have a look uh, on Companies House, the Institute for Statecraft is there. There are lots of uh, documents to look at, uh, including, interestingly enough, uh, uh, an attempt at some point by Companies House. Uh, to um, wind this organization up. Uh, they got away with that with the skin of their teeth. Now, they haven't posted any uh, accounts for this past 12 months, uh, but the most recent accounts are from July 2017. Uh, and if you look in there, well, the, the compared to, to what has been released in these documents for uh, their expenditure in the coming year, uh, the, the amounts of money are relatively small. Uh, I think they're uh, income was about four or five hundred thousand pounds in 2016 2017 um, but what was interesting in there Patrick was uh, one name uh, stuck out for me and that was that they were allocating money uh, to assist the open society uh, and so that then brings us back to uh, to potentially to George Soros it, it, it does Mike and there's other links as well in there but what's really uh, what, what what's I'm going to comment Mike that the name of this think tank is quite cryptic, the Institute for Statecraft. Yes. Uh, if you look up the definition of statecraft, and by, by definition, this is interfering or meddling uh, in other countries' affairs. So it's not like the mission isn't hidden, Mike. So it's, it's right there in plain sight. Absolutely. Now, I say, uh, as I said uh, earlier, we, we were looking at this with uh, a fair degree of skepticism at the beginning. Uh, very, very interested in the documentation and the names that are on that documentation. Uh, but in fact, since then, the, in the uh, Integrity Initiative has uh, released a formal statement. Uh, and they say the Integrity Initiative is part, uh, a partnership of several independent institutions uh, led by the Institute of Statecraft. This international public program was set up in 2015 to counter disinformation and other forms of malign influence 
being conducted by states and sub-state actors seeking to interfere in democratic processes and to undermine public confidence in national public institutions. The Institute for Statecraft is a not-for-profit charity dedicated to education in good governance and to enabling societies to adapt to a rapidly changing world. It conducts research, promotes models of best practices, runs programs for societal development. I wonder who asked them to do that, but anyway, uh, and actively challenges threats to social harmony and democratic values. The Institute is financed primarily by grant support uh, to its programs. Uh, but then it goes on to say, uh, for the first two years, the Integrity Initiative was funded by private individuals. Funding for 2017 and 2018 was provided by a grant from the UK Foreign and Commonwealth Office. Apologies for the glitches on that. I'm not quite sure why it's happening. Uh, the, this reflects their appreciation of the importance of the threat uh, and a wish to support civil society programs seeking to rebuild the ability of democratic societies to resist large-scale malicious disinformation and influence campaigns. Uh, it is, of course, a matter of deep regret that Integrity Initiative documents have been stolen and posted online, still more so that in breach of any defensible practice, Russian state propaganda outlets have published or republished a large number of names and contact details. We're currently engaging with all our network participants, international partners and national authorities as appropriate following this attack. I wonder whether they have engaged with the information commissioner uh, as they're obliged to do under the law uh, in order to uh, um, explain how this uh, breach has taken place and make sure that it doesn't happen again. But uh, nonetheless, uh, what they're saying here is that any media outlet which has highlighted this leak uh, and has drawn attention to it or written an article about it. Uh, any uh, media outlet uh, that does that is in breach of any defensible practice. Well, I would disagree with that absolutely, Patrick. Uh, there is a massive public interest uh, case here. Mm -hmm. uh, if Britain is, I mean, we know that Britain has a department uh, for uh, counter disinformation in the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. It's headed up by Andy Price. We're not allowed to know what his terms of reference are, what the scope of his role is, how many people he has working with him. He was on the list uh, provided by the, through these leaked documents. So uh, it seems that his efforts within the Foreign and Commonwealth Office are related to what's going on here. But of course, this is much broader than uh, Foreign and Commonwealth Office staff. It goes way beyond that. But where are we, Patrick, if in the 21st century, in this post-truth era, in the age of fake news, where are we if we have government departments working with a think tank, working with individuals from uh, a network of individuals from the mainstream media who are supposed to be holding everybody else to account? Where are we under those circumstances? Well, uh, firstly, the, the gag that the Integrity Initiative is trying to pull here, which is that uh, if something gets leaked or something uh, gets circulated and it might be in the public interest that you're not allowed to look at it. Uh, CNN tried this gag, Chris Cuomo, uh, when the WikiLeaks documents came out, he said, you, you shouldn't be looking at that. That's a crime to look at that. We're the media. We'll look at it. We'll look through it and we'll decide for you what, what's important and then we'll show you. This is what CNN attempted to do. Uh, during this, uh, during the big WikiLeaks document dump. So this is exactly the same authoritarian uh, attitude that uh, the Integrity Initiative is taking. That should tell you, Mike, that statement alone should tell you a lot about the values of this uh, Institute of Statecraft that supposedly has this very uh, uh, waxing polemic in their ethical statement about how all the great things that they're doing for society. At the end of the day, Mike, this, we're, what we're looking at here is exactly what many of us suspected for years, but couldn't quite put our finger on because mm. we didn't know the framework, because it was always obscured. It's no longer obscured. Now we can see exactly how it's put together, mm. the methods, who's involved, uh, and the central dissemination hubs, uh, the DFR labs, the Atlantic Council, according to these documents, seem to be running point on a lot of that. And the fact that they are meddling uh, in the democratic process of the country of Spain, Mike, I don't know if we'll cover that later, but that seems to me like a, a, a real tangible <laughs> takeaway from this. They, they, uh, a ministerial appointment to the mm -hmm. defense ministry of Spain, this network got thrown out within hours by doing a, a defamation campaign on social media using an army of bots and trolls, or trolls, maybe bots, I don't know. 
but definitely uh, trolls as part of the network to then feed uh, talking points to the press and to defame and slander. Uh, this, I think Pedro Banos was his name, he was up for a uh, Homeland Security advisor uh, to the Spanish president. Uh, he, his, his appointment was spiked, Mike, because of this, this trolling network. Uh, and so apparently his crime was that he was too uh, friendly to Russia. He, he was exhibiting r rhetoric that was too friendly to Russia, therefore he had to be knocked out. That is a, Mike, that's the British government-led program mm. meddling uh, in another EU country's political affairs. Russia didn't do that. Russia didn't do that. Russia isn't, doesn't, well, <laughs> they accuse Russia of doing all these things, Mike, like having troll armies and everything's directed by the Kremlin, but haven't provided any proof for it. They accuse all the Russian media outlets of spreading propaganda and disinformation, but haven't actually shown any examples of, of real disinformation or debunked any, any of the thousands of stories per week that are produced by Russian media outlets. And here we, Mike, we have the proof that European states and Britain and the U.S. and the rest of the gang are doing exactly what they're accusing Russia of doing. Well, uh, it's interesting, isn't it, that, that there has been complete, a complete media blackout within the U.K. on this. The only media, mainstream media organizations that have published anything on this are RT and Sputnik. Mm. Uh, and uh, none of the U.K.-based mainstream media has published anything on this. However, uh, an academic, David Miller, um, did ask David Aronovich uh, if he was involved in this. Uh, and here's the, the Twitter thread. Uh, and what's really interesting about this, Patrick, is how quickly this degrades into David Aronovich making threats of libel cases. And, and you, you know, this isn't, uh, David uh, Miller has not made any statement here. He has asked a question. He's asked a question. David Aronovich, were you involved in this? Did you know about this? And, and what, how were you involved in this? And Aronovich has tried to rip his throat out here, effectively uh, saying, you know, you, you will retract that question and you will apologize for asking that question or I will sue you. Oh, so you can't ask the question. So you can't even ask the question, so, Patrick. So David Aronovich said, first he said this was a hoax. Uh, clearly it's not, they've admitted that these are real documents and they, there's a hack. So I think David Aronovich's Ram, issue should be with the integrity initiative of why have they put my innocent name on this list of um, a secret network of uh, counter propaganda uh, trolls uh, in the media and embeds. So that would be the question I'd be asking the integrity initiative. But no, he's attacking this academic David Miller, Mike. And, the, and if people don't remember who David Aronovich was, he was the biggest voice uh, claiming that there are weapons of mass destruction in Iraq uh, in the run-up to the war. He was one of the biggest war shills uh, that there was. He was leading the charge of this fake construct uh, created by the establishment called the pro-war left. If you remember that during Tony Blair's golden years, that's who David Aronovich is. So uh, I guess a leopard doesn't change his spots, Mike. It certainly seems that way. Um, okay, uh, let's move on then. Uh, quick advertisement uh, for AV 9.1, Democracy and Change, taking place on Sunday the 2nd of December 2018 at the Crown Plaza Hotel in Kensington. Uh, Patrick will be speaking at that alongside uh, Dr. Graham Downing, Ryan Gerrish, Alex Thompson and Ian R. Crane. Details at alternativeview.co.uk. Get along to that if you possibly can. Now, of course, the other uh, story uh, is uh, Brexit. And, uh, well, the uh, European Union, the 27 leaders of the uh, uh, remaining leaders of the European Council have uh, approved the terms of uh, Britain's exit uh, yesterday at this summit. There's Theresa there with Donald Tusk. Uh, she had a wonderful time, apparently. Um, but um, it isn't going terribly well um, since then. In fact, uh, the media yesterday, full of headlines of uh, distress and disgust and complaints and uh, really it isn't going to work. Nobody's happy with it at all. Um, so uh, <clears throat> anyway, this remember is, is uh, the approval of the framework document which describes Britain's future relationship with the EU. Um, and uh, so this is only, this is the subsequent part of the divorce agreement. Uh, and uh, well, she is going to present that to Parliament today and ask them what, th what they think about it. Uh, but here's what she uh, had to say. Uh, MPs will vote on this deal. It will be one of the most significant votes that Parliament has held for many years. 
Uh, she's saying that, uh, sorry, um, on, uh, sorry, on it will depend whether we move forward together as a, uh, into a brighter future or open the door to yet more division, division and uncertainty. Well, division and uncertainty is certainly what we have today. Here's uh, Jeremy Corbyn's reaction to it. He said, this deal leaves us in the worst of all worlds. So he's uh, reflecting on David Cameron's Best of Both Worlds document from uh, 2016. Um, and in fact, um, you know, there are quite some parallels to be drawn between Theresa May's present deal and what he wrote in 2016. Uh, it, however, is giving the likes of this thing, uh, Tony Blair, the opportunity to speak up. So he was on uh, the BBC yesterday morning on the Andrew Marr show, effectively saying uh, this deal boosts the case for a second referendum. Oh, God. And uh, there he so. Is. There, so, he, there he is, back from the grave. Back from the grave. He's going to lead the new centrist party, which is going to emerge from all this, I have no doubt. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, they're really concerned that the UK is going to find itself trapped forever in this backstop customs arrangement. And Emmanuel Macron today, Patrick, uh, was uh, saying that, uh, you know, he would force Britain into this backstop agreement uh, if Britain were to, for example, uh, in, as part of the future negotiations, restrict France's access to the British fishing waters, for example, since we won't be part of the uh, common fisheries policy. Uh, so all the shenanigans continue. Uh, now, just as a bit of a, an update on this, uh, as I say, Theresa May making a statement to the House of Commons today. Uh, I'm sure that would be a peaceful exercise. Uh, and uh, then on around the 11th of December then, there's going to be the vote itself. So there'll be five days of debate uh, culminating in a vote. And if that vote goes ahead, then Brexit is on track. If it doesn't go ahead, uh, then what's going to happen? Is she going to resign at that point? It's very hard to say. It's going to set the stage for a second referendum, right, within, within 12 months. Eff effectively. So, so looking at the various uh, commentary on how long it would take to organize a second referendum, bearing in mind it took uh, something like uh, 20 months to organize the first referendum. Um, actually, if you take all the nonsense out, uh, they could probably pull it off within about 12 weeks. So if they could, if they could start that process by the end of, uh, if it is their intention to start that process by the end of the year, uh, then they could theoretically uh, hold a second referendum just about in time for the deadline on the 29th of March. Uh, is that a likely? I don't think so. Oh. But, but in the meantime, we're just looking at increasing chaos. So December the 13th is, is the next uh, EU summit. Um, so if the deal hasn't been done by then, um, Theresa May could theoretically go back to the European Council at that time on the 13th, 14th of December and ask for more concessions. More time? Uh, possibly more time. Uh, and then in January, the uh, European Parliament itself will vote on this deal. So th they also have to vote on the deal. But in the meantime, uh, over the weekend, uh, the uh, Telegraph had this headline, Secret Plan B for Brexit Cabinet and EU uh, plot 11th hour alternatives to Theresa May's deal. So she's saying there is no alternative, no other deal. Uh, but in fact, um, it's looking like uh, some people are looking at other deals. Could this be the, the little group of people that didn't uh, resign uh, when, you know, a week or so ago uh, doing some backdoor trading? I'm not really sure, but, uh, but the Telegraph suggesting that there is a plan B. And in fact, the DUP said that if, the plan, if there was a plan B and it, uh, it, as long as it didn't include the separation of uh, Northern Ireland from the rest of the United Kingdom, uh, that, that the, the DUP would support it at least. So, so you know, the, all bets are off at this point. We wait to see what go, will happen. Go back to that slide with, um, I believe this is Mr. Juncker uh, and Theresa May. Uh, she's shaking hands with... Uh, Sorry, which, which, which one? Uh, is, oh, that one. Is, is this yeah, Juncker? Okay, okay. So what does this picture tell us, Mike? Uh, well, well, my question when I saw it was, what is this picture supposed to tell us according to the Telegraph? The implication is that, that Juncker is holding out his hand and, and Theresa is rejecting it. That mm -hmm. seems to be what is implied by that. Well, most of her photos contain odd quirks, Mike, so I, don't, I might not read too much into it. But what, what this does say is that, uh, just based on the text, um, that the EU has accepted this deal. Right. So, the, so what does this mean? The toxicity between Europe, Mike, 
and Theresa May is effectively gone. It's in the past now, according to where we're at at this point. I'm not convinced there was ever any real toxicity there at but, all. But, but in terms of the media perception of May versus the EU, that's done. So Remainers as well will look at this and say, well, there's not a toxic relationship between this government and Brussels. So they'll sort of tick that as a positive thing uh, in their tick box, Mike. So that's one thing out of the way. And so what does that mean? Well, we'll find out on December 7th. We will indeed. Uh, I, I personally think uh, the chances of a second referendum are pretty high at this point, unless there's some, uh, some significant uh, opposition to it. And I don't see any significant bre pro-Brexit campaign out there at the moment. Mm -hmm. Well, you do have just a disruptive, uh, some exactly. a asymmetric, exactly. uh, um, hybrid disruptive yeah. forces. Yeah. Uh, and so that that might also be enough to derail it, Mike. Yes. Uh, if there's another agenda down the road. Maybe we'll talk about this during the extra extra time segment after the show. Yeah. OK, look, we'll, we'll end uh, with Syria because, of course, the news from Syria over the weekend was uh, was a an alleged chemical attack. Uh, which, well, it's not alleged because people were injured by it. Uh, but this, of course, was not the so-called regime carrying out this attack, Patrick. It was the so-called rebels. Sure. And it wasn't the first time either, Mike. But uh, I don't know if you have any more details on this or not. But um, well, then, well, this DW report here uh, is headlined uh, Russia bombs militants after Aleppo chlorine attack. So Russia... Uh, recognizing who it was that carried out the attack. Uh, and uh, so they were uh, bombing uh, militant uh, uh, locations in Idlib. Uh, and uh, the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights, according to this report, said multiple aerial bombardments hit the edges of the last opposition Idlib bastion on Sunday. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was followed up then with uh, with an article today in, from Sana uh, saying that uh, shortly after targeted Aleppo's residential neighborhoods with shells, uh, sorry, after targeting Aleppo's uh, residential neighborhoods with shells containing toxic gases, Jabhat al-Nusra terrorist organization deployed around 50 missiles carrying toxic chemicals in several areas in Idlib and its countryside. Uh, and they are suggesting that uh, these missiles were modified by French experts in a location near Idlib's central prison to carry chlorine payloads. So these mm -hmm. were, missiles were not originally designed to carry uh, chlorine payloads, but they have been modified to do so. Uh, so once again, we seem to be seeing uh, suggestions that uh, Western countries and Western uh, interests uh, directly involved with these so-called uh, militants, so-called uh, rebels. Right, freedom-loving, democracy-loving rebels, uh, reformers, democratic reformers. So this isn't the first time that the so-called rebels or terrorists uh, have uh, mounted chemical weapon strikes against civilians. It's happened, it's been documented many, many other times. And in some cases, some of these rebel uh, chemical weapons incidents have also been reappropriated by the opposition and blamed on the so-called regime. And those testimonies and that information has somehow made its way into uh, UN reports uh, over the years. And this is being used as evidence of the regime using chemical weapons. I think this, this incident, Mike, uh, really shows... Uh, it, it, it does show the true colors of the opposition. Not only that, though, I think we should we're, be worried, Mike, because uh, this was a ramshackle kind of makeshift uh, attack uh, by the rebels. And uh, there's two things to take away from this. One is that it, it, this, could, this could be a prelude to a bigger, more well-staged attack, maybe in the heart of Idlib. And what they would do is they would blame that on the regime or the Russian-backed Syrian government uh, as, as a revenge attack for this ramshackle uh, chemical weapons uh, mm. uh, strike that we saw yesterday uh, or the, over the weekend. So they're, they're, they could be setting up a, a narrative here, uh, basically, and saying, that, so basically the rebels say, well, we, we, we did an unproven homemade chemical attack, but the regime struck us with sarin bombs, and they'll have the videos ready uh, from the white helmets, and they'll send those to CNN and everybody uh, lightning, lightning fast, everybody getting the videos at the same time, of well, course. Well, it's, it's interesting you say that because also in this article, they say sources said that White Helmets members transported on Wednesday morning five containers full of toxic substances from a warehouse belonging to Al-Nusra to an underground warehouse that had been dug recently near Idlib Central Prison. So uh, this article alleging White Helmets involvement. Yeah. So is that out of the realms of possibility? Well, they're the ones who always seem to provide the evidence, Mike of chemical weapons attacks solely from one source 
which is the white helmets, and then amplified by uh, NATO-linked and Atlantic Council-linked uh, so-called investigative organizations like Bellingcat, who's based in The Hague, uh, right next to all the other uh, multilateral uh, international uh, just international justice organizations mm. now. Mm. So that's interesting. Um, and the the other thing to take away just quickly, if you look at, last thing, Mike, if you look at the footage, go back and look at the footage of this uh, incident and how the Syrian emergency service was reacting, how the victims looked. And the, Mike, there were, there were a lot of injuries, but no, no deaths mm. that I could, and that's, that's actually a consistent result uh, according to weapons experts with real chlorine gas exposure, exposure, Mike. So there's not going to be like 100 people dead and like no one injured or a few people injured. It's like there'll be very few people that die and maybe quite a lot of people with respiratory injuries. That's a realistic uh, result of a so-called cl chlorine attack, especially a makeshift chlorine attack. Chlorine is not a very precise uh, weapon in terms of chemical weapons and it's not normally has never normally been used in the military grade sense like other substances have Mike so so th so what I'm saying is this is a real attack uh, compared to some of what look to be fake or staged uh, uh, events in the past so uh, and I didn't see anybody with garden hoses hosing down the children like we saw in Duma do you see yeah, yeah. the garden hose brigade wasn't at the hospital in Aleppo. Uh, so that's, it's a normal situation, it's a normal reaction. Emergency services dealing in a normal way, no GoPro cameras on the hats mm. and so forth. So you can see the contrast right there. So they can thank the rebels for providing us with a real situation with which to document. Okay, we will leave it there. Um, thank you very much. Sorry, thank you very much for joining us, Patrick, today, and thank you for joining us. Uh, we'll be back at the same time, one p.m. as usual on Wednesday, and we hope to see you then. Bye bye.